So we are continuing this discussion. <coughs> that is this second sutra Janmadi Asyetaka. Mean Janmadi Asyetaka. The meaning is uh, this Brahman, which is uh, omniscient and all pervading, omnipotent. Uh, is the origin of everything. <coughs> I mean, this universe is uh, birth, sustenance, dissolution. All these are rooted in Brahman, this idea at hand. Now, this is not a direct definition of Brahman, but this is an indirect implication as to what Brahman is, you know. Um, that's uh, one approach to uh, God, origin of the universe. In fact, that's the easiest thing that we can do. I mean, the, the simplest way to uh, think of a transcendental uh, original cause for the universe is uh, to think of the multiplicity, the variety, added to posit a God or a reality without which these things cannot exist and which also should be the cause of the, the, uh, the origin of this universe and also uh, should be the point of dissolution of all that exists around. It's the simple thing. So that is one definition. Another definition which is more direct is so-called Surupa Lakshana with Satyam Jnana Manantam Brahma. So these are two fundamental Lakshanas, characteristics or definitions of Brahma. Now we have to remember the Upanishads uh, make it clear again and again that Brahman cannot be defined, cannot be explained, cannot be verbalized. Because anything that is uh, defined or described becomes limited. Anything that you describe becomes limited. The language of the infinite is always silence. So a, a, anything that you define immediately it becomes yeah. finite or defined. The reason is uh, Brahman uh, is, is the uh, cause for liberation or moksha. When we realize our identity as Brahman, it is called moksha or liberation. Now, this moksha is not the result of any action. And that may be very a bit, bit difficult to understand. This is one of the technical points in Vedanta. Moksha si akaryatuvat. It's a famous statement which is repeated again and again. <laughs> So that is called, you know, moksha is not the result of a set of activities by which you produce. So it is not utpadya. And then it is not vikadyam, you know. Utpadyam example for you, you get gold and from which, and from gold you manufacture a golden ornament or you, from clay you manufacture a pot. So, the pot is involved in pre-existing clay. You do some manual uh, imposing a name and form, a form first and the name and you get a uh, pot or pan or glass or whatever it is. So, also gold. You uh, put a form into gold and then give it a name, then you get necklace or rings or whatever it is. So it cannot be manufactured like that. So sometimes you should remember, you know, we do sadhana, we do prayer, we do meditation. Is moksha the result of prayer? Moksha is not a result of prayer. Prayer uh, removes the obstacles in the path of attaining moksha. Prayer prepares the mind for realizing its true nature 
by through nature means prepared, prepares us to realize our true nature. When we realize our true nature, which is Brahman, it is called liberation. But still, it is there is no cause and defect relationship between any of our spiritual sadhanas and liberation. And this is a very it's a bit technical point. You may ask the question in that case without prayer, we do not uh, prayer and meditation, spiritual practices, we do not get uh, spiritual development. In that case, how can we deny the fact that there is a cause and effect relationship between prayer and uh, prayer meditation and the spiritual sadhanas and moksha? Well, the point is, you know. Uh, uh, again, taking the example of the Jusapa Prandi, when this uh, rope is the, on the floor and there is not enough light, so a mistake for snake, you bring light and immediately realize it is not snake but a rope. Okay. Now, is the light the result of the rope? The light doesn't produce the rope. The light removes the darkness that stood as an obstacle in, in your way of realizing or understanding the fact that it is a rope. So light only produces uh, the effect of removing the obstacle, which is darkness. So the light doesn't produce the rope. <laughs> That's an important point in Vedanta. Shastram tu ajnana nivartakam na jnana pravartakam. So all meditation, all prayer, all spiritual practices, reading scriptures, all this. They do not produce knowledge. They, they only remove ignorance. And when ignorance is removed, our true nature is revealed. The rope is not a result of light. The light, the role of light is limited to the role of removing the darkness which, which is an obstacle in our understanding the rope for a rope. That's all. Otherwise the light has nothing to do with the rope. And so, so spiritual practices have nothing to do with liberation. It's an important point to understand. So moksha is That's why you know Moksha is not the result of any of these uh, spiritual practices. But with those spiritual practices, you will not get Moksha that is true. There is no causal relationship. Because if there is a causal relationship, then you know, uh, the, the reality of Moksha becomes an effect and the spiritual practices become the cause. Then it will be limited. Anything which is caused by something will be, will, will be limited for that very reason. Anything which is caused by something means it did not exist earlier. So when we when you get the realization that we are Atman, we are not getting any new knowledge. We are getting rid of a wrong notion. See, suppose you have uh, well, you've forgotten your passport or identity card is in your pocket, but mistake you will you you suddenly remember it is not there in the place where you kept. You forgot it is in your pocket, and after long efforts, you finally understand it's in your pocket. So it is not something a great discovery. It's already the the wrong notion that it was elsewhere is removed. That's all. So that's why it will, that's a, it's important. Moksha is not Ulpatya. That's an important point. So in the Bhashya, it comes in the fourth sutra Bhashya. That is, Ato Avidya Karpita Samsarita Nivartanena Nitya Mukta Atma Surupa Samarpana Na Moksha Siya Anitya Dosha. That means Moksha can never be Anitya. It can never be impermanent. Because the moment it becomes Ulpatya, like a pot, which is an upadhyaya of clay. In that case, you know, the, that uh, pot which had to form and the name pot did not exist before the pot maker uh, 
processed, did the whole work and we brought a photo of it. So moksha cannot be anitya, it is nitya. Even if you do not think, even if you do not realize Brahman, you are Brahman. The fact that you are Brahman doesn't depend upon your realization of the fact you are Brahman. That's the only thing. The fact that we are Brahman is not dependent upon our recognition of the fact that we are Brahman. Even if we think that we are uh, body, mind and intellect, still we do not really become body, mind or intellect. If, if you think the rope is a snake, it never becomes a rope. Even if you think we are not Brahman, we don't cease to be Brahman. You know, it's a bit of a dialectic, so that's why you have to, you have to suffer this uh, onslaught, you know, <laughs> this is the most... <laughs> so, if you get take interest in this kind of logic, one interesting thing is, first of all, the grandeur of Vedanta uh, will become so obvious. This entrepreneurship, uh, in Christian theology, for example, you know, uh, there is a fundamental cause and effect relationship between moksha uh, and uh, you are taking, uh, you are taking uh, refuse in the seriousness of Jesus. If you do not accept the reality of original sin, the radical sinfulness of man. Just, I mean, Augustine's uh, fundamental principle. And if you don't accept the fact that Jesus is the only path, is a savior, Jesus is the son of God, who came to purge of the sins of mankind, and by taking refuge in Jesus, you get liberation from the original sin which is an inherited original sin coming on little from Adam and Abraham. Now, uh, so there is always a cause and effect relationship. You take refuge in Jesus, the Savior ship, then you become liberated. But here it is not so. You may think you are this body, still you cannot be the body. Just any more than the rock becomes the rope, sorry, the snake becomes the snake if you mistake the rock for the snake. So you cannot be, rock can never be the snake. Ato avidya karpita samsarita nivartanena nitya muktatma sarupa samarpana nama obsusya nitya Otherwise, you know what happens? You become liberated now, you become bound, bound again. A mukta is always a mukta. There's no question of going back to a state of bondage in Vedanta. So understand. Yasya madhe utpadhyo mokshas tasya Mate manasam vachigam kayakam va kayarim abekshadi idi yuktam. Tata vigayadi te chatta yogu paksha yogu mokshasya dhromani anityatu. So if you think that moksha is utpadya like a pot that is produced from clay, then also moksha becomes anitya. I mean the pot can be broken, it can go back to clay. So cannot be. So moksha is not like a pot is not Utpati. So also Vikarya. Vikarya means like, you know, uh, make becoming curd is Vikarya. Something, you know, something be becomes something else. <coughs> so, Neki the Dhyadi Vikarya. So, the Dhi, you know, this uh, curds, yogurt, you call it. it is Vikarya. We can even change, milk becoming the change, uh, milk becoming the, the thing. So it's not like, it's not Vikarya. So moksha is neither Upadhyaya, something that could be produced anew, or Vikarya, something that comes into existence as a result of changes taking place in instruction. Upadhyaya <coughs> Vagadhyaya Nityam Dushtam Loki Na Chapidena Vikarya Veksha Swatmanubhutvi Satya Anapitva. Anapitva means Moksha is not Apyam. Apyam means from Grama Grama Dharamgecha. In example, you go from one village to another village. So from a state of bondage, you, be, you reach a state of freedom, liberation. It's not like that. If one state is left behind, you reach another state. It's like you get back to your home, you don't need any special effort. 
Your true identity, our true identity is that we are Brahman, we are the liberated, we are the ever, ever free, ever, ever liberated, ever pure, immortal reality. So everything else is a superimposition. So when you get into the superimposition, uh, we only get back to our true original stage. It's like if there is a foreign body, through medicine you may get rid of it. Uh, what is left is your true nature. Health is the natural state of human body and mind. A, f a foreign tendency, foreign thought, means uh, something alien to mind becomes the cause of mental problem. Something alien to the body becomes the cause of bodily problem. Sickness. So, moksha is not apya. It is not something that you reach, attain, like going from one village to another. You leave behind something and get something, G -g get some work which is new. And also it is from samskarya. Samskarya means, you know, like oil seeds. From oil seed to processing, you become, you get, uh, you get oil. Uh, from, uh, from, uh, you may call it, maybe from iron oil you get steel. From uh, crude you become, you get oil, petroleum oil, like that. <coughs> That's why Brahmanaga Anapyatu. So that's why it is say Samsaru, Samskaru Hinama, Samskarasya, Gunathane Nava, Sya Dosha Banay Nava. So, you know, uh, again, uh, moksha is not the result of any kind of processing, purification, refinery, for example. As I mentioned, you know, uh, crude, where you, where you process it, you refine it, in a refinery you get. Oil. So, in the process, either you get rid of some impurity or you add something else. That's the only way to process. Some extra things are added and also in the process, some uh, extra things are removed. It is called processing or refining. So, there are only four ways of uh, bringing anything new uh, into existence. Either you manufacture a pot from clay or you get something through processing or refining as you know like, like uh, crude uh, becoming crude oil or something like that uh, or seeds from seeds to processing you get uh, uh, oil or you go get rid of you get go from one place to another place, Apya, none of these are applicable to Moksha. It means Moksha is Swayam Prakasha, Sudha Siddha. It is, it is Siddha, means it is already our true nature. Our true nature itself is that we are ever free, we are the eternal, the divine reality present everywhere. All other, uh, all other notions are wrong notions. So that's an important principle in Vedanta. <coughs> now why uh, the commentator stresses this point? The, diff the reason is, you know, in, in Purami Mamsa, as I mentioned, you know, your duty is to perform these external rituals and your means, your, sorry, your goal, supreme goal is to attain dharma and dharma is something that is that has to be processed, that has to be made, is bhavya or upadhyaya. When you do rituals, uh, when you perform yajnas, yagas, etc. Agni Hoa, Agni Hotra, Agni Stoma, Apte Yama, Vajibaya, Soma Yaga, whatever it is, Adhiratra. Oh, when you perform all these rituals, you, you produce the merit, the positive merits of all these rituals. So the Adrashita Murad Puram is produced and this helps you to go to Surga for heaven. And when that is exhausted, you come back. This is Puram. So, in their case, the ultimate goal is bhavya, something it to be made, to be brought into existence. 
Utpad is something to be produced, but not moksha. Moksha is our true nature. Now this is a fundamental thesis in Vedanta, Advaita. Our true nature, whether we realize it or not, is that we are the ever free, we are the uh, divine reality. It was this message that actually uh, made a great impact on uh, on parliament of religions where Swamiji made his speeches. So you find the the early speeches beginning with September 11, 1893. All the important speeches that Swamiji made in the parliament of religion, where he uh, he stressed again and again the fact that we are, are not inherently sinless, inherently we are the ever liberated, ever free Atman. Now this was a very revolutionary idea. All it comes from the Upanishads and the scriptures, but then uh, the Western world was listening to this for the first time. And again, historically speaking, in our 19th century, uh, religion as a whole was facing a big crisis. Two, three events uh, made a great uh, impact on world religions, especially Abrahamic religions. One was Darwin's publication of Origin of Species, which questioned creationism. Uh, I mean, the idea that God creates world on a particular day. This idea you find in many monotheistic Hindu faith systems also. You know? I mean, Brahmaji creates this world. It is not wrong. Vedanta doesn't say it is wrong. It is right at a very particular level. See, if you go to kindergarten and you ask the child his, uh, his knowledge, his idea of knowledge, will be totally different from the uh, teachings or the ideas of a more advanced scientist. So as we evolve in spiritual life, we evolve from gross to subtle, from many to one, and from, uh, from positing a creator girl creating this world towards the idea of, the, of going in search of the ultimate cause, beginning your inquiry from the effect. From effect you trace, you start a journey tracing the origin back to uh, one fundamental spiritual principle. So, that is the uh, that is the reason why Swamiji made a great impact. One was this, uh, I mean, the the Vedanta impact, impact of Vedanta, uh, especially the difference it made in the context of creationist ideas. Second, of course, it is not closely related to this. It was the Marxist uh, doctrine of uh, uh, radical humanism, which is. Uh, it is an effect of an impact of the publication of uh, Das Kapital and the Communist Manifesto, which later on to be shapes in uh, mostly in, in, in France and Britain, which uh, gave uh, to many radical humanistic ideas, uh, questioning the uh, the doctrine of a transcendental moral authority. The third one was neo positivism which rejected everything uh, that doesn't stand the scrutiny of modern science and technology. But this idea, the fact that our true nature is not that we are sinners, but rather our true nature is that we are the ever free. So all other ideas of bondage, um, I mean, uh, spiritual slavery, uh, come out of our identification with something other than our true nature. That is, we are this body, we are this mind, we are this intellect. If we get rid of these wrong notions, then we get back to our true nature, that we are the earth. So, this is an important uh, uh, point that is made in the commentary. That is, moksha siya Moksha is not the result of any of our actions. But at the same time, uh, our spiritual practices do have a very important place in Vedanta. Uh, our Nishkama Karma, prayer, meditation, 
they are very very vital very important because without these we won't be able to uh, make our mind ready purify our mind to understand our true nature that is that's why you know karma uh, nishthayaga chitta shuddhi dwarana prasadha vedattam na swadantrena jnana nishthato swadantrena prasadha hetu anyana peksha the commentator says in the mandrikarya upanishad bhashya I mean karya bhashya so that's an important point to remember after this of course we will go back to the text proper so the next sutra is third one that is uh, shastra yonitva that's an important sutra shastra yonitva <coughs> so i shall take that text before taking the text give you an idea yeah <coughs> meaning the simple meaning of the of this uh, sutra is the scripture is the means for getting the right knowledge the scripture the mean uh, scripture or suti or vedanta vedanta scriptures is only right means for right knowledge with regard to dharma now how do we understand uh, you know there is a possibility that this could be uh, this may not be uh, be very obvious how can books be the source of knowledge even sri ramakrishna says you know you take an admana you don't get a, mm-hmm. a drop of water and uh, you get a list of different items for going to trade jews and once you know what you are supposed to buy for shopping then you get it on the piece of paper it's of no use to you in fact one of the central principles of vedanta itself is the books cannot explain the so the books cannot take you to the highest realization so that's the central principle so in the mundaka upanishad you know the uh, a rich uh, rich man who is a spiritual seeker he comes to angira rishi and asks the question uh, please teach me the truth and then he says you know there are two types of knowledge the supreme knowledge para para jiva para uh, two types para vidya da para vidya para vidya supreme knowledge para vidya secondary knowledge. Um, in a way, even the Upanishads, Vedanta, everything is secondary knowledge, like physics or chemistry, mathematics. Books by themselves uh, cannot give the highest experience. The central thesis of Vedanta. Uh, this is a very important point. So, how do we understand this? Now, this should be understood in this context. <coughs> you know, Vedanta. Uh, accepts six pramanas that is pratyaksha anumana gumana shabda artha prati anubhayati these are the six pramanas that vedanta accepts uh, different systems of philosophy other than vedanta accept different tools in their epistemology the theory of knowledge bauthas and charvakas for example bauthas accept two charvaka accept only pratyaksha pramana what is but is obvious very fair the mind and the senses of perception alone is real because they they are mostly accidentalists 
may you do chow at in Arabico. Everything as everything happens by accident. You don't look for a transcendental cause for things happening in this world. And Bhautta sometimes they are only two, two pramanas. And Sankhya and Yoga they accept only three pramanas. And Nayayagas accept four pramanas. You know. So like that, so the, you know, Sankhya and Yoga so we know protection uh, and shapta. And the Nayayaga Bhumana also it's a very important pramana for them. Uh, the Prabhagara school of Imam accept five. And the Vilabdhidi is not accept. And the Bhatam Imamsa and Vedanta accept six. Pratyaksha, Anumana, Bhumana, Sabda, Arthavati, Anubhilabdhi. These are six Pramanas. Pratyaksha is direct perception. <coughs> when we, you, you observe things with your senses of perception and mind. Uh, inference is, uh, you know, uh, is uh, Anumana. Which are the Aristotle also. This is a common to Aristotle, in fact. And then Upamana is an you know, example illustration. Shabda is verbal testimony. Aktabhati, you know, by, uh, by accident. Anubhati, what when it is something absent, you come to know of his absence. I don't go into those details because right now Pramana Shastra cannot be explained. This could take a long time. But if you touch it, we cannot. Do it easily. Now the question arises: What's the meaning of the statement Shastra Yonitwa? The point is, Shastra here means statements from the Upanishads, which are directly linked to the experiences of sages. Certain statements, which are directly uh, experienced by the sages. See, most of the pramanas other than Shabda Pramana are related to Pratyaksha. Of course, Shabda Pramana may also have something to do with Pratyaksha because it also contains statements from sages who had experience and part of the experience may be direct perception also. So, uh, all, exp all uh, epistemological tools, theory of knowledge, have some connection with the Pratyaksha Pramana. But the higher spiritual truths cannot be perceived or inferred or compared, that means either Pratyaksha, Anumana, Gubana, or so, through means which can be, through methods which can be employed in understanding or analyzing empirical knowledge. For that we need another source. So that source is called here Shastra. So it's not mere Shabda Pramana the way I understand it superficially. The example is given there. Uh, of course one important method in, Shabda, in Shastra is uh, uh, analyzing the meaning of a Shastra, an important text, on the basis of six characteristics, which are called Shabitha Lingani, Ubakrama uba Ubasamkara Abhyasa Purvada Phalam, then Arthavada Ubabhati. These are the six Shabitha Lingam is called, which may not be familiar with. Upakrama Upasamkara can be taken separately or together. If taken together, it is six. If separately, it is seven. So, the beginning and the conclusion of a text. There should be identity. They should, they should collaborate. The Abhyasa means the same. What idea is repeated again and again, stressed again and again. Aprodha means the unique, the certain unique theme of a particular text. Phala means uh, certain result, the benefits of uh, getting certain ideas or knowledge will be mentioned in that book. Then Arthavada means eology, certain uh, texts, certain statements be repeatedly again and again, will be praised, emphasized. Upapati means logical, 
logical scrutiny, logical corroboration. Now, if you employ, if you analyze the central theme, the driving message of any text on the basis of this Sarvidhar Inkani, then there should be some kind of uh, corroboration or identity with regard to the central theme of that book. So that's one thing. But here, going beyond that, there is something else with this one, with this uh, meaning of Shastra. So the view, Mananda view, Nidhya Siddhartha. One example is taken. Means, you first of all, you should listen to something. And then you should uh, uh, do <coughs> deep contemplation, the meaning of what you hear. And then through meditation, you should use the English word, may internalize. So you may say, you reach the experience dimension of what you hear. What you hear. That's all we can say. So, Sravana is not enough. Listen, that's why, you know, so now you are coming to exactly what Sri Ramakrishna meant when he said that Almana cannot be a substitute for rainwater. <laughs> so, through Sravana, you don't stop. Manana will give you uh, the real implication of what you hear, what you read. The reading also is equivalent to Sravana for a for a very careful read. Yes. So Swadhyaya in the analysis of Swadhyaya it is stated, you know, when you read a book with a great sense of sanctity, uh, with a great sense of earnestness, then what happens is what you read will have the effect of listening. Uh, to a great teacher. Of course, listening to a great teacher through Badesha will transmit not only the meaning but also the power. It doesn't happen through Manana, of course. But then, so far as the, the Shastra, the intellectual content is concerned, Manana will help you to get the true meaning, to reach the true meaning of what you hear, what you read. And through meditation, we reach the experience level of uh, what you read. So, so the view, mantra view, this is the Asitabhya. Now, such statements, when this is standing, So, this text is an example of how the text itself takes you, take you beyond itself, beyond themselves. The text will take you beyond themselves. The Upanishad texts themselves tell you, first of all, you should listen to the Upanishads. You should use your intelligence and do manana and do meditation and finally you reach the experience dimension of what they teach. That, so that is when a suktiya, yuktiya, swanabhutiya. So it all ends with swanabhuti, one's own internal experience. So, now, in such a context, Shastram, Moksha Shastra, they become the Supreme Pramana. Because you cannot get the highest spiritual knowledge through direct perception for a beginner. And whatever amount of inference you make, inferential analysis or comparison, or just going on reading scriptures or other means, it cannot really give you, take you to the highest experience dimension. So, uh, that is, Sruti, we must listen to Sruti's in Vedanti text. Yukti, we must rationally analyze through Manana. And the Swami Bhudi, through the Dityasana and Dhyana, we must reach the experience level. Here, in this context, you can see an example of how the Shastra them, them itself, Shastras, the Moksha Shastras themselves take you beyond their own realm. So, the example given in the Bhashya is very simple. It has got a great uh, implication. It is taken from the Chandogya Upanishad, sixth chapter. Uh, it's a dialogue between, uh, 
ಬಿಬಿಟಿ ಉದ್ದಾಲಗ ಶ್ವೇತಕೀತು ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ಟೀನ್ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣ ಸಾಧ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಆಫ್ ಚಾಂದೋಗಿಯ ಉಪನಿಷ ಸೊ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ದ ಫೋರ್ಟೀನ್ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣ ದರ್ ಈಸ್ ಅ ಡೈರೆಕ್ಟ್ ಎಕ್ಸಾಂಪಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಕ್ಲಿಯರ್ ಎಕ್ಸಾಂಪಲ್ ಆಫ್ ವಾಟ್ ಶಾಸ್ತ್ರ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ದ ಸೊ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಏತ್ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣ ಯು ನೋ ದ ತತ್ವಮಸಿ ಮಹಾವಾಕ್ಯ ವಿಚಾರ ಬಿಗಿನ್ಸ್ ಐ ಮೀನ್ ತತ್ವಮಸಿ ಇಸ್ ದಿ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಫೋರ್ ಮಹಾವಾಕ್ಯ ಇಸ್ ದಿ ಕುಪದೇಶ ವಾಕ್ಯ ಇಸ್ ದಿ ಬಿಗಿನಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಲ್ ಸಾಧನ ಸೊ ಉದ್ದಾರಗ ಟೀಚರ್ ಶ್ವೇತ ಗೀತು ದಿಸ್ ಮಹಾವಾಕ್ಯ ದರ್ ಈಸ್ ತತ್ವಂ ಅಸಿ ದರ್ ಆತ್ಮ ದರ್ ಐದು ದಾರ್ ನಿಮಿದ ಸರ್ವಂ ತತ್ಯಂ ಶ್ವೇತ ದಟ್ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ಟ್ರೂತ್ ದಟ್ ಆತ್ಮನ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಯು ಯುವರ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ the reality you are looking for is non different non distinct from yourself this is instruct this is given but uh, it is not obvious to say the gitu so there are gives a number of illustrations in the 14th brahmana there is an illustration the illustration is very graphic so a great pilgrim uh, spiritual seeker was going back from india to his hometown it's called gandhar gandhar desa so gandhar purusha drishtanta this is the name of the particular context i mean the illustration based on the experience of that great pilgrim who came from gandhar country gandhar desa to this kind of afghanistan Interestingly, you know, in those days there was a direct uh, land route from India's western borders all the way to Afghanistan and beyond that Persia. So sp- spiritual pilgrims and students used to travel up and down. So it is said that Brother Elizabeth Chandukya Upanishad Samaritha. So it may belong to around 4th million and 5th million in BC. That's the, that's the time when this Upanishad is stories are set. Okay, now, one pilgrim, after uh, maybe a practical going, training, various scriptures, is going back to his hometown, Gandharadesha. On the way, he is uh, he's ambushed by some robbers, and the robbers uh, rob him and then uh, drag him into the thick forest, and they tied him to a tree, Uh, blindfolded and his hands and feet tied the tree this how the text begins <clears throat> and they went their way now when that pilgrim is uh, is tied the tree what he should do you should remember he is a mumukshu he is, is a jiva mumukshu spiritual seeker he is a moksha of thieves what should he do he should make a lot of noise because the state in which he was placed is a state of bondage the blindfold the, the cloth that is used to make him blindfold to uh, to to tie his eyes the ropes used for tying his feet his legs and the robber should came all these represent different challenges that a spiritual seeker has to face in this world so his own actions performed in previous life papas punyas his creative bondage and his ignorance and his own interest in uh, in the worldly in worldly pleasures worldly enjoyments temptations all around all these represent different challenges that contribute to the state of complete spiritual slavery or bondage in other words you know that that's very you know it's called anathi maya sukto yatha jiva prabuddhi ajamanidra vasottam advairam vidhi tatha you find this in the mantrika karika so he is in a state of deep slumber spiritual slumber 
and he is in a state of spiritual slavery. If a true spiritual seeker, he should make a lot of noise so that some pilgrims taking their route will come to his rescue, remove the I mean, cut the robes, remove the bodies and take him to the main road and take him back to his hometown. That's what exactly happened. So the Ubali should tell you, oh I'm see, I was caught, I was robbed by these thieves. All my possessions were taken away. I'm dragged into this thick forest. I'm left alone here. Please come and save me. Then the Bhashya uh, produces you know, the whole scene in a graphic style. Shankaracharya puts in his mouth. He look at me and my condition is pathetic. Robbers came, they robbed me, they bound me hand and foot and they left me in the thick forest. So please come and save me. He makes a lot of noise. When he makes a lot of noise, somebody listens to him. And uh, another pilgrim who was taking the road, who was returning, who was taking the opposite road, uh, heard this noise, came to where he was uh, lying and uh, removed his ties, the blindfold, brought him back to the main road and they told him, you take this road and you will get back to your hometown. This is one stage of the story. Now, scriptures are like this teacher, this people. The scriptures show your direction. Scriptures will show you this way you go. Just like the light you bring to the semi-dark room, will remove darkness but still if you remove your eyes closed or refuse to admit that it is not snake but rope then you won't get the reality of what it is. So the scriptures will show him the right road which he can take back his hometown. And then the Bhashya continues. How this pilgrim should continue his journey. He should, he should carefully listen to the instructions from the teacher. He is called his Acharyas, Acharya Pradesha. Because the teacher tells him, you take this road. And then he should carefully follow. And then Pardido Methavi. He should be, these are the words used in the commentary. He should be intelligent enough to properly understand the instructions of the teacher. And he should also have the ability to retain the instructions that he received from the teacher. So when we read this book, when we read any book that uh, speaks of the highest spiritual truth, first of all, we must listen carefully when somebody teaches. And then, we must retain those instructions in our minds. So Pandita means we should be able to listen and understand. Methavi means Granta Dharana Shakti means you should be able to understand, keep and retain those instructions in the mind. And then you should follow the same road with the teacher had taught him about. And on the way there will be temptations. You may find a road, you may find a place where three, four roads meet. You may be confused which way to take. For that, what you should do, the basic signboards, left or right. So, in our spiritual journey, we must uh, practice meditation, jaba, and also we must associate with other spiritual seekers. So, there are pilgrims walk coming from the same direction, from rather from his hometown. He should ask them which way I should take. What part, part road, four or five roads meeting together in a junction, what road I should take to get back to my home. So for that you should associate with spiritual seekers. You should meet fellow pilgrims and you must uh, enrich mutually our spiritual life by discussing 
spiritual topics it's called satsanga by practicing our own spiritual sadhanas meditation jaba whatever it is and also we must be very careful not to be dragged away from our central focus so the bhashi gara and diga gara se on the way we are taking your route back to your gandhara desh maybe there is a wonderful garden and that side and you take that then you may perhaps you may have a tend- tendency of temptation to take it by lane and you may end, you may uh, land in a power and precipice fall so these are temptations in spiritual life so all these instructions come from a teacher scripture because the teacher himself was taking that road back and forth acharya is teacher so the teachings of scriptures are important because those teaching come teachings come from teachers who have this experience as the background it is not theories whatever theories they are talking about instructions they are giving they are based on direct experience because this teacher in this kind of the shastra we this teacher was walking up and down the same road so he knows it sadly how to get back to gandhara desha from that point from that junction so he will teach the pilgrim to take this road and if you want a pilgrim you should be careful on the way you may you may you may find yourself in the middle of the road several roads meeting so you should know which road to take and also there are some very dangerous things and also there are very tempting things we should be very careful about so scriptures play very important role in spiritual life no this knowledge of brahman from where is we get you may ask the question what about the great teachers the great teachers what they say are scriptures scriptures do not necessarily mean just a book in fact all books all scriptures get their authority from the experience that's why you know swami vivekananda made a statement in 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 his lectures you know uh, an idea doesn't get at authenticity because krishna had said it krishna gets authenticity because he had followed the idea uh, you see vedas do not get authenticity because krishna had said it krishna gets authenticity because he followed vedas so the continuous succession of great teachers maybe incarnations acharyas other men of women of experience who had followed this path and who have reached the goal teaching the goal speech experience so experience is the foundation of scriptures so shastra become a source of spiritual knowledge known by themselves a book by itself is not sacred in vedanta a book by itself is not sacred a book becomes sacred because it may contain certain great spiritual ideas which are Built, which are based on direct experiences of those who follow that path. So that is the true implication of this uh, this statement. Shastra, you need to know. Shastra, you need to know. Now we'll come we'll come to this text proper. <coughs> so <clears throat> now the question arises you know when you talk about shastram vedas what books are we talking about that's an important thing so here is a purabaksha is a you know an obstacle 
कथम पुनः ब्रह्मण का शास्त्र प्रमाण प्रमाण उच्चे या बदो आमना ऐसे क्रिया तत्व आनर्थ के मध्यर्थाना इति क्रिया परित्यम शास्त्र से पुदर्शित हूँ अदो वेदान वेदान नामा आनर्थ के मक्रिया तत्व सर इसे मेरी इसे एक ऑब्जेक्शन विच आई सेलेक्ट ट्राई एक्सप्लेन सी इट कम्स फ्रॉम इमाम सर ऐसे मेंशन डेरिया दिस ऑब्जेक्शन सी काउंटर व्य� Projected by Shankaracharya himself, the purpose is to focus on certain fundamental principles of Vedanta. So for that, he is as uh, he is uh, uh, giving some examples of some contrary views, and how those contrary views are technically wrong. Now here is a statement from Mimamsa. According to Mimamsa, you know, Shastra Sya Anarthakya Akriyarthatva means. In the whole Vedic literature, as you know, there are four sections. There is Samhita, Brahmanam, Aranyika, Upanishad. So there is a four sections. Samhita contains stutis, being mostly hymns, being praise of different deities. So the first, uh, for example, the, the first uh, Ruk itself is, you know, Akni Mili, Piro, Vidam, Yitnisidev, Muktisam, Kotaram, Viratnathartam. This is the first. And so, Aknim Ile, the first mantra itself in Rukveda. Ruk means mantra, means uh, I propitiate, I praise, I pay tribute, go down before Akni. Yekyasi Deva Murtizam Khodayaram Ratna Dhatam. This Agni Yekya Vahakana means. So, whatever you offer on the uh, fire, Havi, that Havi is taken to different Devas and Devatas. By Agni. So that is why Agni is called Purohita. Say Purohita means Purohagachini, the one who walks in front of you. So the meaning of Purohita is somebody who walks in front of you, who guides you, who leads you. So Agni is the great Purohita, means the one who walks in front of you, who takes your offerings to different deities. And the whole Rukhveda Samkhya ends with Yathasu Sahasati. That is the 190th Sutta of Tarita Mandala. Now, what I want to tell you is, all these mantras, more than nearly 11,000 Rukhs mantras, more than 1,000 Suktas, some Suktas very few, very small, some Suktas very long. So, different deities are mentioned. Varuna, Agni, Deva, Prithivi, Indra, Soma, Oma and so on. Now, this Samkhita gives you the hymns that you should chant when you perform the Yajnas, Yagas and so on. Brahmanas give certain instructions, how to, certain technical instructions, how to perform, I mean, what kind of technical things are required, ingredients, how you should organize it, navy, etc. All the technical rules and regulations. Aranyaga, uh, again, they, they can be in the form of hymns and also they can be in the form of instructions. Some Aranyagas are highly philosophical, some Upanishads are also from Aranyaga. And the Upanishads are the, 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 the essence of the whole Vedic literature, of which we have got about 240 Upanishads. Full text may not be available for, no, for more, more, uh, beyond 180 Upanishads. And of which 10 Upanishads, if you include uh, one or two more, maybe 12 or 13 Upanishads are very important, and 10 Upanishads which were founded upon by Shankaracharya, the Bhashigara, are the most important Upanishads. Now, the question arises, if you take the whole Vedic literature, the real statements indicating the highest spiritual knowledge are very few. Even in the Brahadaranaga Chandogya Upanishads, there are lo large sections Dealing with Yajnas, Yagas, you know, Ashwamedha, all that you find in it. And all bright rituals are mentioned, even the Chandogya, Bhirgaanyaka, Upanishads. 
So, what is the essence of Shastra? What, what do you mean by Shastra here? Now, according to Mimamsalas, Pura Mimamsalas, any Upanishadic statement which does not directly prompt you, which, which doesn't include an injection for a ritual, is meaningless. Anarthakya. So, Amnayasya Anarthakya means, the Amnaya means Vedas. Amnaya de Upadishyade Dharma Arenaidi Amnaya. This is Guru Vimamsa's definition of Amnaya. So, here is a quotation from Guru Vimamsa's Sutra. Amnayasya Kriyatutva Anarthakya Adalarthana. Iti kriya parattum shastrasya pradashyam. Ataka vedandhanam anarthakyam akriya arthaktva. So all the Upanishad statement, major, all the important statements, see Aham Brahma Asmi, Tattumasi, Prakyanam Brahma, Ayamatma Brahma, and there are many many great statements. For Mahavakya Sarda, there are some statements which are almost as great as the four Mahavakya. Vidya Vakyas, many many Mahavakyas are there. They do not contain any injection for any ritual. They make some great statements as to what the nature of reality is, as to what our real Sudhupa is, what the ultimate goal of human life is. They don't directly tell you go and do Yajna Yaga, etc. They don't tell you. So, Mimamsa, the Mimamsa, I say those are meaningless. Aham Brahma is totally meaningless so far, Mimamsa. Tattvasi is totally meaningless. The most important statements for Vedantins are totally meaningless for Mimamsa. Why? Because like Mimamsa say, Amnaya say Kriya Tattva. Amnaya means Veda. It's meant for Kriya. Sapta Havir Yajna. Yeah, you perform certain rituals, you start a fire, uh, you should go and perform these external rituals with the Sankalpa, with a different purpose. The whole purpose of Vedic literature is to instruct you to perform these rituals. All other statements are totally meaningless. They have got Anarthagya means the state of being totally irrelevant or meaningless. But the Vedanta Vakyas have no, they don't contain any injunction for karma. So they are totally meaningless. This is being of So what is Shastra? Now Vedantins say, on the other hand, before I read I can explain to you what, it, what we are going to discuss. Vedantins answer is very simple. See, you are talking about these yajnas, yagas, and you perform these yajnas and yagas, they will produce uh, other star and purva, and you go to heaven and all that. And, well, that's the result of your performance of yajnas and yagas. And when you go to heaven, sorga prapti. And sorga, how long will you live? Till the merits of your good actions, yajnas and yagas, are exhausted. After that, you you will be driven out of the five-star hotel. Because you have paid a fixed amount. The amount you have deposited in the five-star hotel is the Yajnas and Yadras performance. When that money is gone, that punya is exhausted. Shine punya, Marthi Roga Vishanti. You come back to this world. So, this is the condition. So, how can you say it is something permanent? It is a very relative thing. It is something empirical. In fact, the most important statements should be those statements we do not contain an injunction for karma. There is other view of Vedas. If there is any injunction in Veda, Veda in the Vedas, which contain, if there is any statement in the Vedas which contain a direct injunction for a ritual, for that very reason, those statements should have only relative value. Because they are talking about a ritual. And you perform that ritual. It produces a result. That result is impermanent. So it doesn't have much permanent value. On the other hand, the great statements like Brahm, like Ahambrahmasmi, Tattumasi, um, 
പ്രജ്ഞാനം ബ്രഹ്മായ മാതൃമ മെനി ഗ്രേറ്റ് സ്റ്റേറ്റ്മെന്റ്സ് ആർ ടെൻ ദ ഗുഡ് പെർമനന്റ് റിലവൻസ് ബിക്കോസ് ദ ഡു നോട്ട് ടോക്ക് അബൌട്ട് റിച്വൽസ് ദ ടോക്ക് അബൌട്ട് സെറ്റൻ യൂണിവേഴ്സൽ സ്പിരിച്വൽ ട്രൂസ് വിച്ച് ആർ നോട്ട് ഡിപ്പെൻഡൻ്റ് അപ്പോൺ എക്സ്റ്റേണൽ റിച്വൽസ് ആൻഡ് വിച്ച് ആർ ഓഫ് പെർമനന്റ് വാല്യൂ സോ ദാറ്റ് ഈസ് ദി റിപ്ലൈ ഗിവൻ ബൈ വേദാന്റ് സോ വാട്ട് ആർ ദ ശാസ്ത്രാസ് ശാസ്ത്രാസ് ആർ ദോസ് സ്റ്റേറ്റ്മെന്റ്സ് വി ടോക്ക് അബൌട്ട് സം universal spiritual truths which are applicable and relevant for the whole humanity for all times and all ages i mean going beyond the boundary lines of time space culture nationality everything certain fundamental universal spiritual truths with the meaning of life nature of the divine reality they cons- these ideas constitute the central theme of these great statements they alone have permanent value okay now this is the uh, this is the reply given by vedantins so perhaps you know i will discuss this in the next section you can perhaps you know <coughs> ask questions you know okay. last time we didn't get enough time If you don't have questions, I will continue the text, of course. Sir, I have a small question. Ah. So, I don't know much about Buddhism, but uh, mm, yeah. in, in uh, Buddhism, is it the same that Brahm, we are all Brahman, but the manifestation might be different? Yeah. yeah. Buddhism, uh, B- Buddhism is essentially based on what they call it by Anathavada, I mean Anathmavada. They don't believe in an eternal atman so it is a tricky subject you know uh, the point is uh, both the bahayanis and hinayanis they believe in nirvana so if you accept the chatvari arya satyani the four noble truths you know i mean there is dukkha there is a cause for dukkha there is a way out the way out in nirvana and then in the process they also give uh, an outline of what you should practice you know eight fold path samyak drishti samyak smriti samyak vyayama like you know samyak ajiva or samyak walk all this with the mean this eight fold uh, path based on righteousness the right speech the right uh, livelihood uh, you know the right memory Uh, all this are uh, mentioned when you practice all this you get nirvana now when you get nirvana your life cycle life cycle comes to an end because your desire is completely trishna is completely exhausted your life cycle comes to an end but they all they talk about a feeling of blissfulness and liberation at the time of nirvana so who gets who experiences this blissfulness or liberation <coughs> buddhists do not give a direct reply so uh, to say that buddhism doesn't speak about an atman doesn't speak about an ultimate spiritual principle is wrong uh, outwardly it is called anatma vad they reject atma but then they had to accept that accept one permanent reality which undergo which experiences nirvana after realizing the four noble truths and following the eight four path they they get nirvana and when they get nirvana the life cycle comes to an end because you completely transcend trishna and then you get liberation so and also that liberation is associated with an experience of bliss who experiences that bliss so uh, there are many vedantic scholars who have interpreted buddhism uh, buddhist philosophy uh, who tell you that buddhism is only an agnostic system is not an atheistic system but the silence to ananda his disciple who Ananda was the disciple who put questions to Buddha on God 
Buddha did not give direct reply. Uh, so it only uh, implies the total indescribability, non-definability of God, ultimate reality. So uh, you, you have to remember, of course, this time. So uh, to understand this, you have to keep in mind that Buddhism had two different stages in its evolution. Buddhist philosophy. One was uh, after Buddha's passing away, 50 years, 80 years after his passing away, his teachings were collected uh, and a number of bhikshus assembled uh, may, may somewhere near Rajikrika, that is in today's Vika state, this capital of uh, the Sishunaga, Nandarena, Sishunaga, you know, the 6th century. Before, 6th and 4th, 5th century BC. So, uh, the, the Bhikshus, uh, the first Buddhist council, they collected the teachings of Buddha, who uh, these monks, who are still supposed to remember Buddha's teachings, because he Buddha taught in Prakrit. Prakrit, uh, all those teachings were uh, later codified in Pali script. So, the uh, the, they all of them gathered all these teachings and they came to be known as three pedagas, the three baskets. Sutta pedaga, Vinaya pedaga, Abhidhamma pedaga. So, this is one stage in the evolution of Buddhist scriptures. I mean, this is called the Pali canonical literature, which constitute the central authority for uh, Hinayana Buddhism. Mostly Buddhi, Buddhism that is prevalent in Sri Lanka, Burma, Siam, Thailand, and those countries. So, they are more individualistic, they stress the individual liberation in contrast with Mahayanis. Mahayana is more popular in countries in Japan, China, and other places, Tibet. So, uh, what happened was, this is one stage. The second stage in, Buddhi, uh, in Buddhist philosophical system was, it began, it began from, four, from 2nd century BC onwards. You have to remember Buddha passed away maybe around 480 BC. He was born in 560, sorry, he was born 560 BC and passed away in 480 BC. You have to come backward before Jesus. Yeah. So he lived for 80 years. So from 2nd century BC onwards, a new trend started in Buddhist tradition. A number of as Vedantic scholars, Vedic scholars, Sanskrit educated scholars joined Buddhism and they became great Buddhist monks. They wrote books on Buddhism which later uh, formed the foundation of four distinct schools, later Buddhism as it is called. Sautrantika, Vaibhashya, Vijnanavada and Shunyavada. So two schools of idealism and two schools of realism. Mahayana and Hinayana they were the religious denominations. Hinayana was related to Sautrantika and Vaibhashika schools of Buddhism. Mahayana was related to the Sunyavada and Vijnanavada schools of Buddhism. Today in this country you come across the mindfulness uh, in all these <coughs> many such Buddhist meditation, Vipassana. These are all related one way or other to Mahayana uh, Buddhism. In fact, the, uh, it's something very funny, you know. Uh, a number of books are written on mindfulness. So, mindfulness is not, not anything new. They put it as if something dead creation. Buddha's famous uh, discourse on permanent awareness called Sthidu Vattana Sutta in Bali or Sthidu Vastana Sutta in Sanskrit. That is the basis of mindfulness. So, Buddha gave a long discourse on this subject. I discussed, I, I, I gave a Sunday lecture on this subject. The philosophical link of mindfulness about uh, three months back in San Francisco. So the, the, the scriptural link of mindfulness is related to this Sthidi Vattana Sutta or Sthidi Vastana Sutra in Sanskrit. So what happened, you know, from second century onwards, two distinct philosophical streams emerged. Two schools of realism, Sautra and Tigasin Vaibhashyas, who believed in the reality of external objects and two schools of idealism known as Vijnanavada and Sunyavada 
Srinivada uh, denies the existence of subject and object and uh, Vijnanavada is called Yoga Jara system. It's a kind of subjective idealism. They, uh, they negate the reality of external objects but they accept one Vijnana platform on which all memories come and go. So, uh, Buddhism in its true aspect may be called a humanistic interpretation of Vedanta. This is one approach given by Swami Vivekananda. Of course, you have to remember, you know, Swamiji did not get time to write or think seriously about these things. In a flashing uh, way, Swamiji uh, made many hints. So, according to Swamiji and according to later Indian philosopher Lord Rathakshman, who translated Dhammapada into English from Bali. So, according to these great scholars, um, what Buddha did was, he gave a humanistic interpretation of Vedanta. Uh, that view, we have to remember, you know, when we quote Swamiji, we should remember, Swamiji made the statement and disappeared. The, and later on, for at least 30-40 years, like Radhavi, Radhakshan and others, they continued. But afterwards, it, that trend came to an end. So today, in this country, and also in Europe, in London, we are being there, you know, you cannot really talk about that. They don't even understand it. Because uh, the work was not taken up to go deeper into Buddha's contribution in this area. After China's uh, invasion of Tibet, a large number of Lamas, not Lamas, Lamas, Buddhist Lamas came to Europe and America. So Vajrayana Mahayana system became very popular. So its uh, Vedantic link uh, came to be recognized less and less ever since that trend. This is about Buddhism. Uh, you want to ask? Yes, are you done with that question? Yeah. Thank you. Swamiji, these, these two questions, I have two questions, they are not necessarily related to uh, the Shankara part, but because you are mentioning again and again, I have to ask you. First is, you said something about uh, the Nimantaka's view of heaven is not the Christian view of heaven. In the Christian view of heaven, you come to God and it's a one time only. Yeah. Nimantaka is like a vacation paid for with your karma during the yeah. your life and then there is an expiry yeah. and then you come back. Do Nimantakas also have a hell concept? Do they have a, if you have brownie points you go to this vacation and if you have negative brownie points you go to hell. Do they, I just want to know. No, they believe in hell. hell. The hell idea is shared by Mimamsas and also by the Pauranikas. Pauranik is this group though. They talk about thousands of different kinds of hell. <laughs> so, very terrifying, you know. So, and this idea of hell, it doesn't come very distinctly in Mimamsa texts like Kumail Bhattas, Yoga Vartika and Tantra Vartika or Narayana Bhattas books, you know. Uh, Antenas, uh, you know, Viveka, many of these books, uh, they don't distinctly discuss the hell aspect of it. Because remember, one thing in Indian philosophical tradition, one thing is uh, they, they did not actually accept uh, the doctrine of uh, uh, doctrine of the theory of evil. I mean, did not they did not posit. Uh, anti-God entity who is parallel to God who is trying to capture human souls away from God's ways you know that's the idea behind you know remember it doesn't come from the Bible you, you won't find anything in the New Testament as we understand if you, if you take that Bible uh, if you uh, the I mean uh, the parables the Sermon on the Mount and some of the instructions that uh, Jesus gave to <coughs> the disciples. These are the original teachings of Jesus. The rest of what you get about hell is actually from Augustine and St. Paul. And St. Paul came later. St. Paul had not seen Jesus. 
St. Paul wrote, he was a Roman and he claimed to have a, get a vision of Jesus and he became a fanatical Christian and he was the one who actually formed uh, uh, Christians into a separate non-Jewish sect. Before St. Paul, Jude Jewish uh, Christianity was essentially a, a sect within Judaism. All the direct disciples of Jesus were Jews. St. Paul came uh, about 50-60 years later and he claimed that he had a vision of Jesus. And so he told Christians, you are a separate sect, you should not follow the Jewish Sabbath and uh, you, have a, you have a different orientation. So all these dogmatic ideas were superimposed upon Christianity by St. Paul in 1st century AD. And the next important st stage was St. Augustine, 5th century AD. He was the one who actually emphasized the doctrine of uh, radical sinfulness of man and uh, you don't you don't uh, hear much about the the inherent sinful, sinfulness of human beings in in uh, Jesus statement you may literally find it, I mean uh, uh, St. Paul's letters to Corinthians Grecians and Romans you find this famous important episodes of so he was the one who started the process, but even he did not make it such a dogmatic, essential part of Christianity. Later it was taken by uh, St. Augustine, 5th century, 5th century AD. So uh, the heaven, what Jesus must have meant by the heaven idea must be some state of uh, Christian enlightenment. It's totally different from the Mimamsa idea of heaven. Remember, Mimamsa did not give much importance to God. And they did not talk about liberation as we understand today. For Mimamsa, the whole life cycle continues. And when you get a chance, do all these rituals and you'll be able to enjoy heaven. That's all what they want. The famous mantra they used to re repeat, you know, Pashyema Sarada Shadam, Jivema Sarada Shadam, Bhuyasa Sarada Shadat. Sarad means, uh, you know, this autumn season. So let us uh, be endured with enough health uh, to hear for 100 years. Jivema is to live for 100 years. So long life and enjoyment. Enjoyment not in this very vulgar sense. That should be understood. You don't find it, my mom's house are very, they very frugal, very spartan and very puritanical. Yeah, sometimes people get away with the impression that Mimam Sukhas were very uh, sensuous or bohemian, no, totally different. Mimam Sukhas were very frugal, very puritan and uh, they had a very high moral order. Only point is they did not think of this high heavens. So that's an important point, remember. So when we talk about the Mimamsa wanted to enjoy, it's not in the word in the in the sense in which we understand the word today. They were they were they were not vulgar, they were extremely <coughs> Puritan in their approach, attitude, very strict. They were they were very strict to to themselves, totally unsparing in their rituals, in the ceremonies, very puritanical. In fact, all the great Vedantins came from Mimamsa families. Oh, wow. All the great, including Shankaracharya. The greatest Vedantins scholars were all Mimamsa class. Because it is Mimamsa that gives you the background of thorough knowledge of the Vedas. So, I, I, don't, I cannot think of a single great Vedanti. One example, that is Madhusudana. Uh, he was an Ayyayiga. When he was in born Bengal, there was not much of Mimamsa in Bengal, you know. Veda, Veda, Vedas were not systematically studied and memorized in Bengal. No Yajna uh, Yaga. So, uh, there were a few, of course, they, they brought from Mithila, but uh, mostly. Madhusudana belonged to his family name was Misra. 
uh, I think even Chaitanya also Misra. So they originally came from Kanuj or Mithila or somewhere, Bihar place. And uh, Madhusudana, he studied Nyaya, Navi Nyaya, and then he stay, he went to Benaras and stayed there. And he is the great author of Advaita Siddhi, one of the most important Advaitic texts belonging to the post Shankara period. His Gudathani Bhiga commentary on the Gita based on Shankara's commentary and Advaita Siddhi, which is, uh, which is, a, which is a very great dialectical work, uh, one of the greatest uh, books on Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta belonging to the post Shankara period. Pansuna lived in 15th century. He was an Ayayaka. So, many of the great Mimamsas were, sorry, many of the Vedantins were originally from Mimamsa background. Because that gives a thorough knowledge of Vedic text as a whole. So. <coughs> this has created a third question which I cannot, yeah. I will not ask. The second question was, um, I am told that, and it most probably I don't know the whole thing, that, uh, this karmic cycle or punarajanma or our carrying the baggage from the past and slowly getting out of it, uh, that is also an integral part of Hinduism. Yeah. But I cannot reconcile it ever with pure Advaitism. However, uh, clearly both belong. Yeah, yeah, I know. Would you shed some light yeah, on yeah, that yeah, without yeah. being a Mimantaka? I, I yeah. understand that. Shortification thing is and, not yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now, you know, uh, you see, Sadhana Jadushtaya, for example, uh, natural uh, tendency to renounce, to practice detachment to his worldly things, cannot come to a person all of a sudden. So if a person uh, displays a great tendency to renounce things, either he should be a great spiritual person in incarnation or something, or he should be a great sadhaka who have practiced a lot of sadhanas in previous life. Remember, you know, uh, there is no difference among people with regard to the material body, all the same. And there is no difference with regard to Atman, Atman is present, also human beings. Where is the difference? The manifestation <coughs> of the Atman, the evolution of the manifestation of the Atman. That's why Vedanta says, you know, the difference between an Amoeba and a Buddha is not one of, it is one of degrees and not of kind. An amoeba manifests uh, uh, that Atmanhood in a very low degree, uh, and he says a Buddha, and uh, the difference between amoeba and a Buddha he says, Buddha means the enlightened one, not necessarily Gautama Buddha, the enlightened one. It's the literal meaning of the Sanskrit word Buddha. So an enlightened person manifests that Atmanhood uh, in a much higher degree. Why is this difference? Difference is due to the state of mental purity. As you get mentally more and more pure, uh, it's like a, uh, you know a mirror becoming more and more clean, clear. The the sunlight reflects on the mirror. The Atman reflects in our mind more and more clearly. So this takes evolution, cycles of life. So. Uh, well, I can give an example. Uh, there is one statement in the Gospel, in the Kutamada Punajan Mahachi, Siddha Makshana, make that single sentence. Rebirth is a reality, reincarnation is a reality. You remember the statement is there. Now, uh, without having gone through some level of spiritual sadhanas, you cannot actually think of this world and all worldly pleasures as insignificant. And without 
some degree of conviction of the insignificance of these worldly enjoyments. You cannot devote time and energy for any association with Vedanta. Even to work in Vedanta society, to come here and spend your time, energy, or money, or efforts for something which is not directly linked to any practical, tangible, utilitarian benefit. It's impossible without some level of integrity, some level of education. Impossible. Our natural tendency of human mind is to look outward towards things and to judge everything on the utilitarian principle. If you, if you want to uh, take a different direction in life, instead of saying yes to the world but saying no to the world, it requires some degree of spiritual evolution. It may be the result of some sadhanas in previous life. Otherwise, mentally we won't be able to withstand it. In fact. I mean sincerely. Of course, as a curious idea, one may do that. It's a curious idea, you know, uh, people may listen to something novel, that's true, but to sustain and to be linked to that for a long time, <coughs> it is not possible without some previous life. See, if you are a school teacher and if you have 100 students in the class and you are explaining a scientific formula or giving you mathematical lessons, if suddenly if you find one student, uh, uh, quickly understands what you are explaining, naturally. And later you make inquiries, you find that he is coming from an illiterate family. Other children may do that because they are getting special tuitions, or teachers are themselves te teachers, they may be giving special training. But suppose you, ca you come across such cases. Yes, yes, often, yeah. Uh, you, you, he is coming from an illiterate family. Yeah. And maybe in, in India sometimes, in backward places coming from tribal birds, yes. first generation learners, you know. Yes. How do you explain this? See, if you show a skill in front of me, if you take a screwdriver and if you show a skill in preparing a plumbing work, it means you have learned it. Otherwise you won't be able to do that. You, or you may have seen somebody else doing it. Or you may have read a book explaining how to do that. Without some kind of previous acquaintance, you won't be able to do that. If you do that, it only, it only shows you have learned it or you have some acquaintance with it. And there are, there are people who do that, children who do that. And if you make a query, you find when they didn't get any chance to get that kind of thing. So where does it come from? Even if you extend pure scientific logic and reason, you have to get an explanation. And that explanation will take you beyond the realm of this life. So that's the reality. Uh, 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 what's your impression and ideas about Bhagavatam? Bhagavatam, Bhagavatam is the text which deals with heaven, hell, and Lord oh, yeah, yeah. and yes, yes. Yeah, yes, yes. So, uh, where do they fit in, in our understanding? Yeah, you know, Bhagavata and Guru, both are Puranas, but then they belong to different categories, you know. Bhagavata has got a special place, because Bhagavata is in a way purely Advaitic. It begins with Yajma Yasyata, that's the beginning of Bhagavata. In fact, the first <laughs> Bhagavata begins with Yajma Yasyata. <laughs> of course, it is different orientation. And it's a Satyam Param Dhimahi. So Bhagavad has got uh, something very interesting about it, you know. Uh, there are many uh, studies, they have used to the, you know, Gajendra Mo, Studi, Dhruva, Prahlada you, you find many of the hymns in Bhagavad have got a strong Advaitic orientation. So, Vishnu appeared before Dhruva and Vishnu was not a, not a mosquito or a, or a worm to be within you. Vishnu was a huge person 
ധ്രുവ ടെൽസ് വിഷ്ണു അന്തപ്രവിശ്യ മമ വാച്ച് മിമാം പ്രസുപ്ത വിഷ്ണു എൻ്റർ മൈ ഹാർ സിറ്റിംഗ് വിത്ത് ഇൻ മീ ആൻഡ് ദീസ് ആക്ടിവേറ്റിംഗ് മൈ എനർജി മൈ മൈ സെൻസസ് മൈ മൈ വേർഡ്സ് ഈസ് ഗിവിംഗ് ലൈഫ് ടു മൈ വേർഡ് സോ ദാറ്റ്സ് ഹൗ ധ്രുവ സ്തുതി ധ്രുവ സ്കിം ബിഗിൻസ് യു ഫൈൻഡ് ഇൻ ദി ഇൻ ദി ഗജേന്ദ്ര സ്തുതി കുന്തി സ്തുതി സ്റ്റേറ്റ്മെന്റ് ഫസ്റ്റ് bhashe itself and you hear at least the gospel sri ramakrishna says yeah. but the bhashya in the gita bhashya there is one verse yeah that is uh, yeah, that's in the the 13th chapter of 10th verse that is um, അന്യയോഗേന ഭക്തിരവിചാരിണി വിവിക്ത ദേശ സേവിത്വം അനഭിർജന സംസരി ദീൻസ് സോ ദ മീൻസ് അവിവിചാരിണി ഭക്തി പ്യോർ ഡിവോഷൻ ഇസ് എ തിങ് ഹിയർ ആൻഡ് വാട് ശങ്കരാചാര്യ നിർമ്മല ലോങ് ഡിസ്ക്രിപ്ഷൻ ഓഫ് വാട്ട് ഈസ് പ്യോർ ഭക്തി ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് unchanging and wavering and he says sacha jnana oh. that is a which not that knowledge itself maicha ananya yogena bhaktihi bhaktihi abhivijarini vivikta desha sevittum anabhijjana samsati maicha ananya yogena so those who have got devo- devotion towards me without any any distraction and none in yoga and it is uh, it's pure and wavering that that the den and vivikta desha sevitum anabhijjana samsadi you know what they do they do meditation to sadhana in solitude with this thought now in that commentary shankaracharya says he is after describing pure devotion he says sacha sais trilinga it refers to bhakti that bhakti is jnana and shiva mahesha makes it very clear in fact madhusudana's uh, central theme in gurudev divika is a famous commentary by madhusudana saraswati on bhagavad gita so his central theme is to bring out this bhakti element from shankaracharya's gita commentary because he follows shankaracharya's gita commentary because it was forgotten and uh, during the polemical dialectical warfare between the dwaitins and advaitins during the post shankara period dwait mean madhva vadirtha jayatirtha and others and chitsuga chitsuga charya and rishi harsha khandana khandaka that is this confrontation so what happened you know the highest uh, ideal of the synthesis of the highest and purest bhakti jnana which you find in the gita the completely forgotten during this confrontation dialectical confrontation between dwaitins and advaitins during post shankara time it was reconciled by madhusudana in his book the gudartha gudar deepika uh, that's the unique contribution of madhusudana so even 15th century ad and we should remember and make it very clear again and again so the highest bhakti and highest jnana part to see so you don't listen to these con people <laughs> you they would say if okay, i am not giving an example but nothing wrong in openly telling they 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 they, they often use the word mayavadi dwaita is advaita is not mayavada advaita is brahmavada because the anivachini akhyadi maya is defined as anyway they, they mistake mistakenly they call it or deliberately mischievously they call it maya maya it is actually called 
ब्रह्मा बात है एब्सोल्यूट नॉन डिवेलिश दिस दिस मायावाद मायावादी दिस टर्म्स वर यूज्ड बाय द्वैतिंस एक्चुअली एंड यू नो अट द द स्कॉन फिलोसॉफिकली इज लिंक्ड टू मध्वाचार्य Philosophically, he belongs to Madhva tradition. Link to Madhva tradition. There are great men everywhere. You know, Madhva was a great devotee. Ramanuj was a great devotee. You have to remember that. But when you discuss systems of philosophy, well, they were all great men, great spiritual teachers. So I think we can conclude now. You watch. Here is the question. Okay. Maharaj, in relation to the sutra too, you mentioned uh, moksha slakarya tvat. Ah, keep it close. It is not a sutra. It is. It comes in the bhashya bhashya. Come and tell me. Yes. You were you were calling it as the swarupa dakshana, Maharaj. No, it is not. Moksha slakarya tvat is not swarupa dakshana. It is related to a response to mimamsagas. Mimamsagas will tell you. That uh, you should perform all the yagyas and yagas and all the ceremonies, everything, and then later you study Upanishads, and then this you cannot turn to uh, directly, you cannot directly turn to Brahma Mimamsa or Advaita uh, from the livelihood. But Shankaracharya says it's not so. If you go to Sadhana Dhrushta Sampati. You need not study all the Purohimamsa Sutra, so kar, Karma Ganda, you need not study. Because uh, all the resources in Mimamsa tradition are Kairyas, means the effect of Karana. Karana is Karma. Kairi is the effect. So, heaven and worldly prosperity, long life, all these for which the Mimamsa pray for. They, are, they constitute the kaya, the effect. And the kaya and the cause rituals like that. Now, if, the, if, the, if there is a ef cause-effect relationship between uh, spiritual practices or any rituals or whatever it is and moksha, then what happens, you know, moksha comes into existence as a result of what you do. Which means it did not exist before you started your action, your rituals, and it is it, it is dependent upon your performance of rituals. Purana Mamsa, the dharma is bhavya. It is the result of what you the rituals you perform. It is upadya, like ghata that you make from clay. So there is a connection between. Uh, between cause and effect in dharma, which is a theme of Imamsas. That kind of cause and effect doesn't exist in moksha. Moksha means what? The realization that we are Brahman. The moksha and Brahman the same practically. So if you say that this moksha, the state of being liberated, is a result of rituals or any actions, then it did not exist before you start a ritual. Adrishta and Apurva doesn't exist before you perform the Akyas and Yakas. Okay. It comes into existence as a result of it. And because of Adrishta, Dharma, Sorga, etc. They did not exist before you, you start a performance of rituals. Like that if you say, Moksha comes into existence as a result of spiritual sadhanas. It means Moksha did not exist before you start a spiritual sadhana. Even if you don't do any spiritual sadhana, we are muktas. The, the, the reason is we don't realize it. What's the, what's the, what's the advantage of rich, uh, sadhana to realize this? What's the use of bringing a light to dark room to remove darkness? Not to reveal rope. In fact, the light and rope has no connection. The connection is between your ability to, to understand the rope for a rope or not. 
and the light you bring becomes an incidental cause of removing darkness. Removal of darkness. See, the fact that it is a rope doesn't depend upon the removal of darkness. Your understanding is a rope depends upon removal of darkness. But the fact it is a rope doesn't depend upon your understanding is a rope. If you think it is a snake, it will not be a rope. It will not be a snake. So if you think you are bound, you are not bound. That's it. That's why Sri Ramakrishna says, technically he doesn't bring out that. He couldn't tolerate when Jiddu Malli was reading the New Testament. Maybe Old Testament, we don't know. It's not clearly stated. I'm a sinner and all this. Sin, yeah. uh, you see, I don't I think, you know, so what version of Bible Jiddu Malli was reading? I do not know because in the King James Version, which was the received version in those days, you don't find so much of sin. But Sri Ramakrishna heard a lot of word sin again and again. Be Bengali, be, be Bengali version Sri Ramakrishna must have heard. So it could be a Bengali translation of some mostly Unitarian version of Bible. It may not be King James Version translated into, Bible, into Bengali. Because the Bible that was popular in Bengal at that time, the later half 19th century, was the Unitarian version of Bible. See, Unitarian Church was very, 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 very powerful there. It's just called, you know, Unitarianism was founded in 1784 in London. And they were the hosts who invited the case which had sent to London to give lectures. So also Raja Ramon Rai also went to London. He passed away there in Bristol. And there he gave a lot of uh, series of lectures on Christianity. Raja Ramon Rai wrote extensively on Christianity. It was the Unitarian uh, Bible that they must have. They had Catholics too? Eh? These Unitarians are Catholics? No, they are Protestants. They are Protestants. Yeah. So they will... They don't believe in the Holy Trinity, you know. Uh, yeah. uh, so, Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Okay, okay. So, you, we don't know... The, we don't know what version of Bible Sri Ramakrishna listened to. It could be the Unitarian version, the Bengali version. Which there are a lot of pop must be mentioned. <laughs> I didn't talk, he didn't like it very much, you know. Right. So Maharaj, it was more more to make a difference yeah. or more to make the point that it's not a cause and effect to, relation? To, to, to trust the fact that it is immortal, permanent, it, it is Sadhikara It doesn't come into existence and it doesn't disappear. Because that's why anything that is karya is impermanent. A karya comes from a karana. So, before karana became karya, it did not exist. This is impermanent. It comes into existence. Moksha never comes into existence. Because there was no time when you are, you are not a mukta. There was a time when you did not realize it. That's true. But there was no time when you were not a mukta. That's why, that's why Sri Ramakrishna, Swamiji stress again and again, see you are, you are never free, you are not a sinner, you are the, all these are statements from the Upanishads. But they were revolutionary ideas for people who have never listened to anything other than the Abrahamic teaching some sinner and about going to hell and fight and all those things. You know. That's the that's one of the historical reasons why Swami, people liked Swamiji's declarations so much. Because they were, you know, in the parliament of religions, all these representatives of different denominations, they, again and again they must have talked about sin, hell, be careful take refuge in Jesus, otherwise you are going to suffer damnation, eternal damnation, terrible things, you know. So suddenly somebody comes and says, no, you are not, <laughs> you are not going to be damned. You are not seen this. You are never free. It must be a great relief to them <laughs> to be told sinners by every preacher and suddenly a, 
a stranger from the Orient because now you are not seen as you are ever free. That's something they want to hear, especially Americans, you know. Yeah, yeah. and they, we had a, a freedom spirit anyway. Yeah. Americans, this, is, this looks like our own religion. Yeah, it's perfect. It's not a religion, it is something that you would like to have. No, uh, yeah, all right. it's not our religion. Something uh, quite desirable. Yeah. It is consistent with the spirit. Uh, that's true. For us, this is exactly um, how Krishna talks in the second chapter of Gita. Initially, he says, it is eternal, um, uh, is it infinite, and then yeah, he says is, uh, real, and then he says it, it cannot be killed. Yeah. It is not worthless. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it's not beginning of the second. It is from 11 to yeah. 13 verse onwards. She speaks in Dekinosmi, Dadeki, Kumaram, Yavanam, Jarak, Avina, Sita, Viti, and Savavina, like that. Nasuba, Viti, Bao, Nabao, Viti, Tata. So, all these are uh, descriptions of the immortal nature of Atma. The imperishable, immortal, ever being of Atma. That's what so, okay, thank you now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.